Hey everybody, it's your old pal John. Otherwise known as a history buff, but you can call me John, it's fine. Um, here we're gonna be talking about uh reacting to the uh Falklands, the remote okay, the first modern war. Um this is an interesting one. I think Thatcher was involved in this. Um uh Argentina taking over the Falklands. Um it uh I'm not gonna uh, I'll react to it as it goes on, but uh, this is Simon, I think it's Whistler, 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 it'll show it up there. Like I said, the video, or I might not have said, the video link is down below, but uh, let's check it out and see how much I know. In hindsight, it seems like such a bizarre place to fight a war. Windswept and cold islands closer to Whistler. Antarctica than to Europe. A place where hardly anyone lived that didn't offer much economic or strategic value to anybody. And yet, for three months in 1982, the Falkland Islands were all anyone was talking about as the world watched as the militaries of the United Kingdom and Argentina slugged it out over a place most people would have trouble locating on a map. When asked why the war was being fought, the Argentinians said that they were reclaiming sovereign territory illegally legally occupied by a colonizer, while the British argued they were rescuing British subjects held hostage by an invading force. The war in the Falklands was the first modern conflict, a proving ground for new weapons and ideas. It was studied by military tacticians from all over the world. It was a war fought with satellites and advanced jet fighter aircraft with missiles and laser-guided bombs. It was a war followed in real time from thousands of miles away from the action thanks to television, sometimes to the detriment of the men fighting in it. But one thing America. the modern model of warfare couldn't change was how deadly it was. Over 900 lives were lost in nine weeks of conflict. By the time it was over, the sleepy little islands would never be the same again. Okay, this is an interesting one because I'll be honest with you, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Falkland Islands, the people who live there are, they're, they're English or British, I guess. Uh, the, and it was like, didn't they, I, actually, I think in the comments, that's where it was. Somebody said that they voted over overwhelmingly like 99% to stay British. So uh, claiming uh, claiming to be uh, claiming that uh, like if Argentina is claiming that they're part of their own country or their own lands, like I could, like I could see it from a geographical point of view, but that's sort of an old way of thinking because now it has to do with, you know, rights. It's almost sort of like, you know, my, my understanding of Ukraine, like Russia taking over because geographically it's theirs. Not because, and I'm not saying 99% of Ukrainians, you know, want to be Ukrainian, but, you know, clearly there's some majority of Ukrainians that would like to keep their own country. Um, anyway, maybe it's a stretch to do that, but let's, I'll stop talking. Like, like many other places colonized by Europeans during the age of exploration, place. the That's small weird. archipelago 300 miles to the east of the South American coastline was uninhabited when English explorer John Strong came upon it in 1690. Strong names the channel between the two largest islands in the group Falkland Sound after his boss, the Viscount Falkland, treasurer of the navy. The islands themselves eventually took on the name Falklands. They remained uninhabited until the 1760s, when colonies were established by the French and British. The French then surrendered their claim to the Spanish, who kicked mm -hmm. out the British, who came back and then left again in 1774. Right. The Spanish left the islands during the Napoleonic that. Wars, then the islands were claimed by Argentina, who maintained an intermittent presence until the British came back and kicked them out in 1833, asserting that they had never renounced their original 1690 claim over the place. Following this convoluted yep. custody battle, the okay. Falklands remained under British rule for the next 150 years. The islands were settled largely by Scottish and Welsh immigrants who described their new home as being remarkably similar to New Zealand. And like New Zealand, the staple mm. industry for the Falkland Islands would prove to be raising sheep for wool farming, starting with the formation of the Falkland Islands Company in 1851. Once the Panama Canal opened and ships stopped traveling around the tip of South America, sheep farming would become the Falklands only industry. That makes sense. Over I didn't think about the that. land area used for the practice and an average of 300 sheep for every resident of the island the only town of any size. some people like that 
Just saying. Lies in the Falklands is Stanley. Over 80% of the island's population live there, though uh, that isn't saying much. In 1982, that figure was 1,500 people. The rest is colloquially referred to as camp. The dozens of small settlements, mostly sheep farms, that are dotted throughout both East and West Falkland. At the time, no roads outside of Stanley were paved, and in many places, no roads existed at all. People got around on horseback or maybe by dirt bike if they could afford one. Almost everything needs to be imported. Food, fuel, yeah. building materials, vehicles, furniture, electronic equipment. Quite simply, the Falkland Islands are as close to the middle of nowhere as it is possible to get on Earth. Yeah, it's kind of true. Algenzine. Which also makes it very hard to, I guess, have any kind of military expedition. Uh, had routinely protested British possession of the Falkland Islands, which it calls Islas Malvinas ever since they first showed up in 1833. The um, by the way, when I was in Argentina, I did see a lot of signs like that all over the place. So it's very uh, clear in the memory of, of Argentinians. Um, and as a matter of fact, I remember we, my, my backpack partner and I, when we were backpacking down there, she and I were trying to find, um, you know, could we get maybe, you know, go out there for a couple of days? It really, there were no signs to go out there. And I don't even know if you could, but, uh, anyway, but though we did meet a lot of great, uh, great British people that were, um, uh, on holiday down there and were into the backpack and stuff too asserted that kind of cool. a sovereign part of their country that was 2008 including it in official maps and regularly lodging protests at the united nations about it with the collapse of the great european empire starting in the 1950s argentina believed that now they had a chance to pursue their claim to the islands arguing that repossessing them would be part of decolonization efforts in 1965 the un passed a resolution calling on great britain and argentina to resolve their dispute over the islands themselves through dialogue essentially taking no position on the sovereignty debate over the course of 17 years, the governments of the two countries held talks about the islands, never resolving anything, though the British Foreign Office privately advocated handing over the islands, viewing them as bringing little value to the country, and in fact acting as a hindrance to trade with South America. The trouble was, hmm. nobody could convince the Falkland Islanders that becoming part of Argentina was a good idea. Unfortunately for the Argentinians, international opinion on who should govern a place had moved past the issue of sovereignty or who owns it, instead relying on the principle of self determination that is letting the residents of a place decide for themselves what kind of government they wish to have the heaven forbid trouble with the falklands is that it wasn't a colony in africa or asia with a large indigenous population ruled over by a european power the previously uninhabited islands group that was settled by people of european descent it was obviously too small to be its own nation so the only question was which nation the people of the falkland islands wanted to be a part of the answer to that question has always been great britain whenever anyone asked them the 1,800 residents of the Falkland Islands had almost no connection to Argentina. Few people there spoke Spanish, almost none were of Argentinian or even South American descent, and they considered themselves to be British subjects, even if they were more than 8,000 miles from London. And whenever anyone suggested that the Falkland Islands should be turned over to the Argentinians, the Falkland Islanders lobbied passionately in Parliament to make sure that it didn't happen. So, if I'm not mistaken, there were a lot of... Uh, and and this goes to, I think, just to reason that there would be a number of benefits just to keep the islands. And if you're, if you're a Falkland, Falklander, Falk, yeah, Falklander, I'm just going to say, if you live in the Falkland Islands, I would, I guess, rather be part of, um, have my sort of, uh, ruler or larger power be, be written anyway, because, uh, I mean, the, the access there, to a, a larger global trade network would allow me if i if i'm being selfish for you know the island and myself um i, I would have more i would just have more access to things and not to mention that britain is uh, uh, the passports you know you can go you pretty much go anywhere they're friends with everybody everybody likes the british well i mean now uh but it does allow a lot of access Argentina, you know, I'm thinking things like, well, you know, they don't have that great track record. I mean, number one, 
there's always financial issues in Argentina. And number two, they, they accepted all the German Nazis after the war that basically they could. So, yeah. At the start of 1982, the negotiations over the Falklands were hopelessly deadlocked, with most of the rest of the world confused as to why it even mattered that much in the first place. Yes. And then, to the surprise of everyone, Argentina decided to try and force the issue. Argentina had been ruled by a military hunter since 1976, yeah. a hunter that was growing increasingly unpopular at home because of a worsening economic crisis as well as okay. brutal repressions instituted by the military as part of their dirty war against so-called subversive elements, which led to the deaths of between 9,000 and 30,000 people over a 10-year spree of state-sponsored terrorism. The hunter, yeah. headed by General Leopoldo Gautieri, Gautieri, believed that reviving the issue of Los Malvinas would distract the Argentine populace from the discontent at home, lending legitimacy to the military government and instigating a wave of patriotic fervor throughout Argentina. I'm they sure decided to invade the Portlands, occupying them by force. They believed that while the British would protest vociferously, uh, they wouldn't care enough to respond militarily to the occupation. On April the 2nd, 1982, yep. Argentinian troops landed in and around Stanley. They quickly overwhelmed the small garrison of Royal Marines stationed there, securing the surrender of Governor Rex Hunt after a two-hour firefight. The Argentines also occupied South Georgia Island, That's a largely right. uninhabited island located 870 miles east of the Falklands. In London, despite observing the increased buildup of Argentinian forces, the government of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was still largely caught by surprise when news reached them of the invasion of the Falklands. Many ministers were incredulous that Argentina would take such a drastic step. The British asked for a meeting of the UN Security Council, which issued Resolution 502, calling for an immediate withdrawal of all Argentinian forces from the Falklands. Anticipating that Argentina would refuse, Thatcher decided, after conferring with her cabinet, to send troops to the South Atlantic to retake the islands by force. Yeah. Now, here in the States, we, of course, look to ourselves when it's somebody else's war, and I, I do recall um, President Reagan yeah, President Reagan allowed access to satellites for military um, interpretation. Um, and the Hawker Harrier. One of the, I think one of the coolest jets that was ever made. Uh, or at least, the you know, I think it's in the top ten of coolness was used. The biggest problem with waging war for the Falklands was the huge distances involved. The Falklands were 8,000 miles from Britain, meaning that everything needed to mount an invasion would need to be shipped down there far from friendly ports. Their forward operating base would be Ascension Islands, another isolated British outpost situated roughly halfway between Africa and South America, but still 3,800 miles from the Falklands. The mm -hmm. British Naval Task Force, assembled as part of Operation Corporate, centered around two aircraft carriers, HMS Hermes and HMS Invincible which carried only 20 Sea Harrier fighter bombers. Uh, this would be the first sea combat Harrier. test for the Harrier jump jet, okay. a new kind of warplane that was able to take off from the deck of an aircraft carrier vertically like a helicopter. I love all the... the, the it, it's a very, it, This must be a very English thing, but it's very out-of-the-box out of kind of thinking and creation of these military... Um, of military technology. I mean... A vertical takeoff jet. Uh, I know, like, it had been thought about, but, like, you guys just go ahead and do stuff. And it's cool. It would be facing an Argentinian air force that could operate Nobody from else land says that. only a few hundred miles from the Falklands, not to mention there were ten times as many of them. The carriers and their escorts began to set sail from Portsmouth on April the 5th, only three days after the Argentinian invasion. They were joined by two cruise ships pressed into service as troop carriers, bringing two brigades of infantry uh, that would conduct the land portion of the campaign. The task force assembled at Ascension, which was now one of the busiest airports in the world, constantly bringing in men and material for the war effort. In addition to hundreds of aircraft, the total naval strength of the task force would number 127 ships, including cargo vessels borrowed from civilian shipping companies and converted North Sea and Channel ferries. Weeks of diplomatic negotiations went nowhere. Just as the hunter expected, the occupation of the Falklands was wildly popular within Argentina, and they had no intention of giving them up. On the other hand, the I do know that it was very it was very popular. I've seen it myself, and I actually stayed in a a hostel where we talked about. We talked to the owner, 
and they were very, very, you know, happy initially <laughs> with how things went. Is an British old public, guy. for the most part, was behind their government's actions as well. So when the carrier battle group, commanded by Rear Admiral John Sandy Woodward, set sail from Ascension on April the 18th, it was with the intention of going to war. It was the first amphibious operation of this scale conducted by the Royal Navy since the ill-fated Suez Canal expedition in 1956. Right. While the carriers uh, were still moving into position, a small group of commandos were preparing to recapture South Georgia Island from the Argentinians. The shooting war began in earnest on April the 25th when a submarine ARA Santa Fe was spotted and attacked by British helicopters. Look at how old that sub is. That's 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 World War II old. I don't know. I, I'm I'm not a sub expert, but it looks like World War II or just post World War II uh, vintage. So helicopters damaging it severely enough that it was forced to dock at the main South Georgian port of Gride Viken. Commandos already on the island had surrounded the Argentinian garrison and a display of force was enough to convince them and the crew of the submarine to surrender without further resistance. It was a cheap victory for the British. They had lost two helicopters that had crashed during the operation but suffered no casualties. Cheap the Argentinians <laughs> lost one sailor killed, one wounded and 155 captured in addition to losing the submarine. Meanwhile, the British battle group began their own operation to recapture the Falklands on May the 1st. Their first objective was to attempt to establish air... So that's April 2nd is the invasion date and when, it, when the Argentinians uh, launched it. So one month later is May 1st, roughly. Okay. It's, 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 it's decent reaction, I mean, for 1982 and for, uh, I'll be honest, for... Um, you know, for, uh, for the British. I mean, and I'm not... I don't mean that as a put-down. I mean, that's just... Because it came out of the blue. I mean, you know, it, it, you got to look at everything in context. I mean, I, I look at things in terms of sometimes the United States rosy glasses and we have this sort of quick reaction force where you, they can be like, we can have something like 30,000 troops of 20, within 24 hours anywhere in the world. That's the goal. That's We have that on standby. Uh, not so much for for uh, for the British. Um, well, anyway, uh, it's 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 not a put down. It's just interesting. Naval superiority over the area. The government had previously declared an exclusion zone with any Argentinian aircraft or ships coming within 200 miles of the island subject to attack by the task force. Argentina, meanwhile, scrambled both their air force and their navy to try and destroy the British ships, especially the two aircraft carriers. Exclusion zone. One of the first things you do. All right they could take those out, the rest of the task force would be forced to withdraw. Okay. The first major casualty of the war was the Argentinian cruiser ARA General Belgrano, which was hit by two torpedoes fired by a British submarine on May the 2nd and sank, killing 323 men. This had the effect right. of forcing the rest of the Argentinian Navy back into port, and yeah. they would play no further part in the war. But mm -hmm. their air attacks from the Argentinian mainland uh, were stepped up, including planes armed with the deadly Exocet anti-ship missile. One of these yes. struck the British destroyer HMS Sheffield on right. May the 4th, killing 20 sailors and forcing the rest to abandon ship as she was consumed by fire. While attempting to tow the ship back to Ascension Island, she sank, the first Royal Navy ship lost to enemy fire since World War II. Yep. After several weeks of inconclusive air attacks on both sides, the British prepared to send their troops ashore on East Falkland, where almost all of the Argentinian troops were garrisoned. Instead of landing the troops near Stanley, as the Argentinians had done, Major General Jeremy Moore of the Royal Marines, the land forces commander, chose to land at San Carlos, a small settlement on the opposite side of the island from the capital. There's a great movie on this uh, that you can watch. Um, is it called Goose Green? The movie? But I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but it, it, it's a good movie. This operation began on May the 21st, with the Navy ships positioned to protect the landings from Argentinian aircraft. Right. The Battle of San Carlos was mostly fought between the British ships and the Argentinian Air, Air Force, Force, which repeatedly bombed the ships in the harbor, attempting to disrupt the landings. The place would be forever after known as Bomb Alley. 
It lasted for four days, with the British successfully repelling the Argentines and establishing a beachhead, shooting down 22 aircraft in the process. But the victory came I didn't know it was Bomb Alley. Two frigates, HMS Ardent and HMS Antelope, and the destroyer HMS Coventry were all hit and sank, while 49 men were killed. Meanwhile, another Exocet attack sank the cargo ship Atlantic Conveyor, killing 12 crew members and sending a lot of supplies to the bottom, including nine helicopters. The Argentinians Ooh. made one more attempt to sink one of the carriers with their last Exocet missile, on May the 30th, but they missed, ending the most direct threat to the task force. Now mm. the focus of the war would switch to the land operation. The Argentinian army was mostly made up of conscripts, 19-year-old men that were required to serve 12 months in uniform overseen by career officers and NCOs. The class of 1963 had been supplemented by the class of 1962 for the Falklands War, as the command of Brigadier General Mario Mendenez grew to 13,000 soldiers, though some of the army's best units, including battalions trained to fight in the Andes Mountains that might have been better suited to the cold conditions of the Falklands, were left in Argentina because of border tensions with neighboring Chile. The young privates were known affectionately by the Argentine public as Chicos. Initially opposing the Argentinians were the 5,000 men of Britain's three commando brigade, a mixed unit of Royal Marines and soldiers from the Parachute Regiment. It was quite a bit of rivalry between the two. The Marines referred to the Paras as cherry berries because of their red berries, while the Paras retaliated with cabbage heads for the Marines since they wore green ones. But they were among the UK's best ground troops, the country having transitioned to an all-volunteer military in 1963. Some had seen service in Northern Ireland during the worst of the Troubles and uh, were highly trained, but most had never been to war before. The Argentines were concentrated in two areas on East Falkland. The bulk of their forces were in and around Stanley in the east, while a sizable detachment of 1,200 troops were stationed at Goose Green on a narrow isthmus on the western side of the island. General Moore's plan called for the troops to march overland across the island to surround the Stanley defences, but first, Goose Green needed to be taken. The job was assigned to the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment. Two Paris commander, Lieutenant Colonel H. Jones, wasn't a happy man on the night before the attack. The BBC had mistakenly announced over the radio too early that Goose Green would be attacked by his unit, putting the Argentine mm -hmm. defenders on alert. Jones threatened to sue everybody involved with the mess up when he got home. In yeah, uh, that's a that's a big problem for um, when it comes to media. Uh, I don't know how else to. Uh, it, it's a problem, and uh, if you look at it now, they use it to their advantage. There are normally agreements between um, media and because uh, now we have social media. There are usually agreements uh, with governments um, and. Uh, when things get put out uh, and things like that, and it's it it it's just I don't know it's the way it should be, but uh, quite honestly, this is one of the first times that well after after the Vietnam War, I guess that was part of it too. But the Vietnam War, I mean, for us, uh, that was sort of uh, the other side of the world, and they would sort of publish stories afterwards for journalists. Um, this was more along the lines of, you know, as it's happening. Um, interesting. Never got the chance. The Battle of Goose Green was a bloody affair that lasted for 15 hours. The powers oh. had to make a frontal assault on prepared defense positions because of the narrowness of the terrain. 18 attackers were killed, including Colonel Jones, who would posthumously be awarded the Victoria Cross, the country's highest award for gallantry. Between 45 and 55 Argentinians were also killed, and over 100 were wounded before other battle was over, and the remaining soldiers, over 900 in all, surrendered. Victory in hands, the British troops advanced on Stanley, largely unopposed, until they reached a series of defensive positions on the outskirts yes. of the town on high ground. Three Commando Brigade was joined by five brigade, which included battalions of the Scots and Welsh Guards who had been pulled from ceremonial duties guarding the Queen at Buckingham Palace to fight in the Falklands. The Gurkha Rifle What? They were pulled from guarding the Queen? Okay, well I guess if they guard the Queen they've got to be that good. Also known for carrying a distinctive knife from the yes, wall called the, a cookery. the Gurkha knife. Also involved. Kind of like curved. Those are... Gurkhas are nuts. General Menendez and his remaining units were demoralized by this point in the conflict. Many of the soldiers had been led to believe that they would be met by an adoring Spanish-speaking crowd in Stanley waving Argentinian flags. Instead, they found a sullen populace that refused categorically to cooperate with the occupiers, unless forced to. 
Many Falkland Islanders found themselves detained by the Argentinians because of worries they would engage in subversive activities, and the rest found their buildings, livestock, and food regularly stolen or damaged by the soldiers. But the war wasn't over yet. If they could hold the defensive perimeter in Stanley, uh, they could drag the war into the frigid southern hemisphere winter months, stretching the capabilities of the British task force and possibly leading to a negotiated end to the conflict. Air attacks continued despite heavy Argentinian losses, including a devastating strike on the troop ship Sir Galahad killing mm -hmm. 48 men those killed were mainly members of the welsh guards the battalion oh yeah it always kind of surprised me that there was such a big loss a uh, naval loss in um a back and forth air war um i don't know i was always just sort of caught off guard i when i had learned about this when i was younger i thought oh there's no way you know because you're we're always taught that you know all of us as allies at that time in in the 80s are the best were you know invincible and um yeah it was kind of eye-opening in a way even though it was you know you know pretty well executed i think but um maybe a little hasty was forced into reserve for the remainder of the conflict while the wrecked Sir Galahad was towed out to sea and sunk as a war grave the sixth ship in the fleet sunk during the war Still, yeah this setback only delayed the final battle for Stanley by two days two nights of battles on five Argentinian defensive positions June the 11th saw the capture of Mount Harriet two sisters and Mount Longdon by the Royal Marines and three para and on the night of June the 12th the Scots Guards captured Mount Tumbledown while the veterans of Goose Green to para captured Wireless Ridge with the capture of these positions, the Argentinian defense collapsed and soldiers yep. began to retreat into Stanley itself. General Menendez had orders to continue to resist, but he knew his position was hopeless at this point and called for a ceasefire on June the 14th. The same day, he surrendered his command to General Moore. Over 11,000 Argentinians were taken prisoner, forced to give up their weapons, and shipped home on the same cruise liner that had sent their captors to the Falklands. Prime Minister Thatcher announced in the House of Commons that the war was over to public jubilation. It's interesting. I, I I don't know. When I was younger, we were we were taught that Margaret Margaret Thatcher was um a very very well uh very strong leader. And I mean she was a strong person. Um I don't know I, I, uh, my understanding is that it wasn't necessarily the case in Britain. But um I always thought she was a very strong force and uh, a decent leader, but I guess um, history, you know, as and they they usually say, you know, for historians, you know, uh, they should, if you're a good historian, you start to chime in maybe, you know, 20, 30 years after something takes place, and uh, that then you'll know its place in history, but... Um, I don't know. I always thought, you know, they called her the Iron, Iron Lady. I mean, obviously, but uh, I don't know. It seemed like a good response. I mean, I a good thing she didn't declare a victory, a victory with like a mission accomplished sign behind her, and you know, <laughs> it's not really done. The Falklands War lasted two and a half months, but was unexpectedly mm -hmm. bloody. Yeah. The British lost six ships, 24 helicopters, 10 Harriers, and 255 killed, including three Falkland Islanders who were mistakenly hit by a British shell during the Battle for Stanley. Mm -hmm. More than half of the Argentinians, 649 dead, were lost on the sunken General Belgrano. They also lost six other ships, 25 helicopters, and 75 fixed-wing aircraft. But the true lasting effect of the war would be felt in the political futures of both countries. In Great Britain, Margaret Thatcher's approval ratings increased dramatically in the wake of the war, and her Conservative so. Party won the parliamentary elections next year. She'd remain in power until 1990, and given the nickname the Iron Lady because of her hard reputation earned in the conflict. In Argentina, the propaganda bubble, the military junta had built about... If I'm not mistaken, she kind of had this complex of you have to be stronger than a... you have to be as strong as the men and have a tough will. Anyway... 
the invincibility of their forces was popped dramatically. General Gautieri would be sacked as president soon after the surrender and the military dictatorship itself collapsed the next year, leading to the first democratic elections in a decade. The Argentinian military has never regained the prestige that it held for most of the 20th century, and diplomatic relations with the UK would not be restored until 1989. The Falkland Islands, meanwhile, was suddenly flooded with government funding to improve all sorts of infrastructure previously held off for fear of agitating the Argentinians. The most dramatic improvement was the construction of an airbase at Mount Pleasant as part of the Fortress Falklands program. Today, the islands have a permanent military garrison of 1,200 soldiers as well as a squadron of fighter jets and a naval patrol vessel. The economic situation also improved with the establishment of an economic exclusivity zone around the islands. Today, the Falklands make far more money in the deep-sea fishing trade than they do from sheep farming. In more recent decades, surveys have been made within the zone looking for oil deposits, though none have been found yet. Mm. The war did leave scars, though. Equipment from the conflict was scattered all over East Falkland. The presence of 25,000 landmines rendered entire sections of the land unused. The last of these would not be cleared until 2020. Most of the British war dead were wow. repatriated to the UK or buried at sea. But there is a war cemetery at San Carlos for 14 men buried where they fell, including Colonel Jones. The Argentinians refused to allow their dead to be returned and so they were buried on East Falkland. They refused to allow their dead to be returned. That just... It doesn't make any sense. It's like the old term of sort of... Not cutting your nose off to spite your face, but... it. I don't know. It almost seems... You know what it seems like? And this is a horrible analogy, but it seems like just bad sportsmanship. I I know it's a it's a war and I don't know how else to describe it but it's not fair. It's just not fair. Separate cemetery. With the passage of time, the bad feelings engendered by the war faded. The UK and Argentina are on generally friendly terms now. The mm -hmm. most heated rivalry tends to be on the football pitch. Mm -hmm. Argentina continues to push their claim for sovereignty over the Falklands, though they have publicly stated that they will never again try to use force to take them. The British government, on the other hand, considers sovereignty of the Falklands a settled issue. In a referendum held in 2013, 99.8% of the residents voted in favor of the islands remaining a territory of the United Kingdom. You wonder who that 0.2%, that like just to sort of make it sound legitimate, it would be like, you know, hey, Joe, do me a favor and just vote that you want to want Argentina to, you know, just so it's not 100%, because that sounds fake. <laughs> I wonder who did that. They were like, hey, they didn't steal any of my sheep and I got an extra one. You know, it was good for me. Perhaps the biggest legacy of the Falklands War was its effect on military thinking. Most of the world's navies, noting how vulnerable surface ships are to aircraft strikes, have installed advanced close-in weapon systems (CRWS) yeah. to defend themselves from attack. Yep. Naval spending in the UK was increased, and plans to get rid of the country's aircraft carriers were shelved. The land battles, meanwhile, have been generally viewed as textbook examples of successful small unit tactics and proved the value of a smaller, highly trained volunteer army instead of large armies of conscripts. In summation, the Falklands Islands may have been the strangest place to fight a war, and nobody may have cared about the place before, but the war was fought, and they certainly care about the place now. It's just a shame that it took the blood of hundreds of young men to make people care, and that the legacy of this remote outpost of civilization will be forever scarred with the memories of the world's first modern war. That was excellent. Excellent. I, I could listen to him forever. He's got one of those great voices. Um, what do you what do you think about this? Does that sound pretty accurate? Is that the 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 English or the British point of view? I always get the I'm sorry, I'll figure it out. Um uh does that sound entirely accurate to you? Um it seems like a pretty well summed up uh concise situ you know, um understanding of the war. The thing that always irks me, and here and here's my biggest problem with it and i'm just gonna I, i've waited till the end to say this so if you guys are watching here it is i really would love to hear more of the argentinian side of things i would love to talk to someone who was there were any of you there who are watching this i mean obviously a little older than i am well a lot because i was four but i don't know i would love to i would love to um god i would love to talk to somebody about this because you know, our World War II vets, 
they're they're almost gone. My grandfather passed, and he only told me about the fun stuff. Um, you got Vietnam vets that are out there. They're uh, starting to decline in our area, but you know we still have some of the people. Well, we have a good deal, I imagine, of the people who are involved in this. And um, no, no, I, to me that would be a, a great episode to have a number of questions and uh, just to hear somebody's experience on there. I mean, do you know anybody that would be willing to come on? I think that would be great. I don't know if what you guys think. Leave your comments down below. Definitely hit that thumbs up button. Uh, if, you, if you like this, I know it's a little longer than I would want it to be, but um, it really is fabulous uh, in terms of great storytelling. So um, feel free to subscribe to the channel if you like what you're, what you're hearing and seeing. It's an American reacting honestly